Good morning and blessings to you in the house of the Lord. And we bless the Lord in the wonderful house of uh, God, able to praise Him and come into His presence this day. May the joy of the Lord be your strength today on this third Sunday of Advent. We recognize uh, being in uh, the company of God with us. Okay, well, let's stand together and we will move into our time of worship, a call to worship, read responsively, call to worship in our Advent season worship. Rejoice with great joy in singing, for you shall see the glory of the Lord and the splendor of our God. You shall see the Sovereign One whom God has sent to dwell with us and to redeem us. We will rejoice. The way is being prepared for Christ's coming. We are here to listen and prepare for His advent. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for He will come and redeem His people. The glory of the Lord will be revealed. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and shall bear a son and shall call His name Emmanuel. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Let's sing the advent of our God. Just the two verses that we have here. The advent of our God, with eager hearts we greet, and we must praise Him in this sound with hymns and anthems sweet. All glory to the Son, who comes to serve. We ask that your Holy Spirit might enliven us with the joy that comes from being in the family of God, being in Christ. May each one today be led in spirit and in truth to worship you, and that our joy might last for all eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, and let's continue our service with the lighting of the third candle in Advent, the candle light. I was... Uh, Always excited to start this one, uh, the joy candle, the pink candle. So first we had the prophecy candle. We saw how uh, Jesus gives us the sure word of prophecy. And then last week, side with this from Luke chapter 10. Let's read together. You can remain seated. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you you will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Amen. At this time, we're going to celebrate that joy with uh, junior Church, special music, joy to the world, and maybe Junior Church needs a few friends. All right. Okay, good. All right. <laughs>
music is both meaningful and can be fun, too. I hope you'll agree. And so we'll give everybody a chance to at least sing Ring the Bells. And if I can keep my hands off them, I'll stay up here <laughs> and we won't <laughs> ring the bells during the song. But let's, uh, let's go with our medley here. Ring the bells and then uh, Luther's hymn, From Heaven Above to uh, Earth I Come, and then Go Telling on the Mountain. <laughs> Yeah. 
go into a time of prayer and praises and give you a chance also to communicate some updates and prayer requests and other things like that. So we're going to a time of prayer now off camera. Please stand now for the reading of the Gospel together. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 13. Mark 13, starting in verse 30. I tell you the truth. This generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with his assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch, and you may be seated. Two thousand years ago in Palestine, to whom you got married was a decision that you did not make. It was made by mom and dad, or by your guardians, if you didn't have parents still alive. Can you imagine what it would be like to be in an arranged marriage? Uh, children, it seems, were already spoken for at a young age as the parents made the arrangements. And then later on, as they got older, a ceremony of betrothal would take place and a dowry. Money was paid to the bride's family uh, for uh, an, uh, this arranged marriage. Now, we lack some details of what would uh, take place at the actual wedding ceremony, but several months later, or maybe even a year later, uh, what we call a wedding would take place. And the highlight seems to be that a wedding procession would take place at night. The usual custom, as I understand it, was for the bridesmaids to form a little parade through the streets of their town, uh, night streets actually, uh, on their way with the bride to the groom's house for the marriage supper. And Jesus used a background that uh, his listeners would be very familiar with, this marriage uh, procession, and he told a story, a parable that you may already know, but I'm going to remind you of today about the second coming. In the story, Jesus modified some of the details so that the groom was actually coming from a long distance away from some other place uh, uh, and would marry the bride in the local town. So it was coming from a distance, just like Jesus' second coming. He's coming from a distance. And no one uh, knew exactly how long that would take for the groom to come. But as he approached, the bridesmaids were set to go out and form a procession, a parade, we might say, to take him to his new wife, and they would all go into the marriage supper and uh, have a feast, and then uh, things would proceed from there. Can you imagine the anticipation of having your groom or if you're a bridesmaid, uh, the party having to be on hold until the groom comes from a long way away. Now, in the days before we had GPS or cell phones and we didn't have any updates and no text arrival times or any of that, and there wasn't predictable travel tracking, you couldn't see how long it's going to take. The bridesmaids were out there early, hours early. And we might imagine they had their lamps all ready uh, for, because it was getting dark, you know, around the equator, even in the summertime, uh, in the uh, lower latitudes like that, it gets dark uh, at an early time of evening. And so they're out there, and 
They're, have their lamps to access, act as flashlights for the parade. And the groom was a long time coming. Uh, you know, maybe there was road construction out on the turnpike, or maybe the Roman army was using the road and, and they had to wait. Uh, who knows what was going on? But it got whatever happened. It was it was very very late at night, and he arrived in the town at midnight. It was so late that the bridesmaids had all fallen asleep, and at midnight the cry rang out: "Here's the groom! Come out to meet him!" And it's just a narrow window of time, and they all rushed out, and they reached for their flashlights, well, their lamps, as it were, and uh, they went outside, but some of them, all their lamps were out because they had just little tiny lamps, and the oil was all gone, and we would say the batteries ran out, you know, and half of the bridesmaids had already... Uh, thought that this might happen and prepared for the possibility. And so they had extra virgin olive oil right with them to uh, relight the lamps. And the other half of the bridesmaid had no such uh, plans for all this. They had no extra olive oil. And they went out to the nearest convenience store to try to resupply. But when they got back, it was too late to join the parade. They were too late to meet the groom. They were even too late to be let into the house to join in the party. And when the groom came to the door, he didn't know these people. He's from out of town. And he would not let them in to the marriage supper feast. Now the girls that had the ex uh, that didn't carry the extra virgin olive oil with them, they were not evil people. They were not ungodly or immoral people. They just didn't take into consideration the possibility of delay. And they were unprepared at the time when the groom finally arrived. And we find out from this parable that there is no more time after Jesus comes back. There's no time to get ready. There are no more chances. There's no more time at all. Is it any wonder, then, when we come to our passage, that Jesus emphasizes vigilance, be on guard, be ready, keep watch, be alert, watch, keep a sharp lookout, stay awake. That's what we find in our passage today. <laughs> Nothing personal. <laughs> Just take it to heart. <laughs> take heed, look out. Well, Jesus' words are reliable, and Jesus always tells us the truth. God had told a man uh, an example of this, watching out. God had told a man named Simeon something very special. Simeon lived in Jerusalem, and he was doing what was right. He was one of those guys that the Bible calls righteous. He believed in God's word, and he believed in God's promises. And Simeon was even filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, we don't know how long Simeon had to wait, but God told him to wait. The Lord had revealed to Simeon that he would not die until he personally saw the Lord's Christ, the Messiah, that is, the Anointed One. He will personally see the Christ. And so Simeon waited, and he waited. And we don't know how long. But all the time he waited, he was invincible. He wouldn't die. <laughs> Think about that. God has told you, you're not going to die until you see the Christ. What a gift. And he waited and waited. And one day, Mary and Joseph brought in a baby named Jesus to dedicate him to the Lord right in the temple. But the Holy Spirit had already been working, already been working within Simeon. And so he had prompted Simeon no matter how long he had waited, uh, to go into the temple on that exact day. And so Simeon was already there in the temple. And he was waiting when the little family came into the temple. And Simeon took Jesus in his arms, and he blessed God, and he said, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for your revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. 
Oh, the joy Simeon must have had in believing God's word and being invincible, waiting for the time, the Lord to keep his promise to him. Now, we're not invincible, but we too have a promise. We are waiting to see the Lord come back. And you can have the joy in the truth, reliable word of God. It was reliable for the first coming of Christ Jesus, and it's truly reliable for the second coming of Christ. So I want to challenge you this morning. Be a Simeon. Be like Simeon, waiting expectantly for God to keep his reliable word about the second coming. You can have a joy of reliable truth. He's coming again. And Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. We can have a joy in investing our energy in the truth of something that's reliable. Secondly, you can have the joy from Jesus, the joy of anticipation. There are good surprises in store for you. No one knows about that day or hour. Jesus told us, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. Just tells us plainly. We will not know the exact time. I was three years old. Yes, I remember. Some of you know what it's like. And I was really excited because my birthday was coming. Now you know when my birthday is. So. Uh, as the temperature got colder outside, and as uh, I got started to get more excited, and soon it would be December, and as it got to be toward that time, it would be my birthday on December 6th, and there would be presents, and there would be cake, and there would be ice cream, and Dad would get out the new Polaroid instant camera and <laughs> take a picture of me, and I'd be able to see myself, right? opening up presents and loads of fun and oh it would be so happy and I'd be blowing out the candles and I got really really excited and Thanksgiving came and it was gone and you know everything goes so much faster after Thanksgiving and soon it was December 1st and I could stand it no longer and I begged and begged to celebrate early a week early and my parents let me and they gave me a birthday party early on December 1st. Close enough, right? Oh, and the Walsh calendar changed that year. And I celebrated my fourth birthday a week early. And I dug into the wrapping paper and uncovered a beautiful toy backhoe. I still have it today. Not here, but somewhere. And I blew out four candles on four moon pies. <laughs> and, my mom didn't have time to bake a cake. She wasn't thinking she would bake it until six days later. And then when December 6th came for real, my parents had another birthday celebration for me with real cake <laughs> and a wonderful toy gift, Lincoln Logs. And I got to use the backhoe to move the Lincoln Logs around. That was, oh, it was just great. It was just great. I'll never gonna forget that excitement. The joy of anticipation of Christ's second coming is so great that we start celebrating early, just like I did for my fourth birthday. You don't have to wait till Christ comes to have the joy in the celebration. The anticipation of joy, the joy of anticipation starts early. And you can start rejoicing right now. It's okay to be like little children. <laughs> Our joy, yes, in this present age, our joy is going to mingle with sorrow. You know, we have grief, and we also have sadness. But it's kind of like sweet and sour chicken. You know, you get both. Yeah. Well, one day, it's all going to be beautiful, no sour. And the day we anticipate, all the sadness, all the sorrow, all the tears, pain, all that will be gone and forgotten. Right now, we have the joy of anticipating those good things to come. Uh, and it, it's uh, well, that's exciting. It's and maybe your birthday is not in December, but you still can remember the joy of the anticipation of Christmas Day, like when you were a little child. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Well, what happened in the Walsh household is like that. 
Uh, even before dawn on Christmas Day, my brothers and I would scurry down the cold steps to our living room and we'd plug in the Christmas tree lights uh, to see what Santa had brought for us, what was under the tree. And then, oh, stuff would be spilling out of our stockings uh, by the fireplace and all kinds of good candies and maybe an orange and an apple and maybe little toys in there as well. And we get to enjoy all of that. Uh, but, you know, you know what it's like. You don't just have joy on Christmas Day. All the time leading up to Christmas. It's exciting. Long before Christmas, we anticipate good things. And excitement builds and joy takes over the season. And we're happy <laughs> with all of our presents under the tree. And this is a lesson for all people about our Advent joy, because as Jesus' second coming approaches, our joy in his coming increases and takes over all our emotion. He's coming, folks. He's coming. And we can anticipate the glorious arrival with joy, joy anticipated even now. It might also be compared to an apple pie in the oven. What happens, you know, when your pie is baking in the house? <laughs> start to drool. The heat of the oven is going to release some of those wonderful bursts of apple flavor and cinnamon and other kinds of stuff all over the house. And so the, uh, uh, the, all the aroma is going to anticipate it before you even taste a bite. And the pie crust flakes, you know, it's, it's going to uh, be golden brown. And everyone wants a bite right away when it comes out of the oven. But then it has to sit a while. It has to cool to just the right perfection. And all the time we're waiting for that, the flavor is circulating around the house. And even people coming to the door can smell, oh, that's a beautiful pie. And all of that. The aroma prolongs the excitement of the pie. We all know it's going to be wonderful when we take a bite because it's already wonderful and it has been for hours and hours beforehand. Now we're all going to go out and get pie. <laughs> <laughs> Living with the joy of Jesus Christ coming. It's like the preparation, cutting up the apples, and putting the pie in the oven, making the crust, and taking little bites of the crust before it goes in, baking an apple pie, letting it cool to perfection. Or maybe you're not a pie lover, maybe something else. Ribs cooking all day long. <laughs> or barbecue, or if you're an Italian lover, you know, garlic and, and lasagna, baking and baking. Yeah, everybody's going to be hungry now. <laughs> Jesus gives us the joy of anticipation. Anticipate. Now, the joy of anticipation then helps us to wait. Because Jesus gives us some responsibility here. Jesus gives us the responsibility of waiting for the second coming. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house in charge of his servants, each with his assigned task. Tells a warn at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or midnight or rooster crows or at dawn. See, we have responsibilities until that time comes. We have to be faithful, make disciples, bear witness, persevere in your faith, live each day for Jesus. And remember, we're living with joy, so it's not really all difficult. But you may be saying, can there be joy in keeping commands? If someone's telling you what to do, doesn't that just steal all the joy about it? How can there be joy in being an obedient person? See, the enemy has sowed seeds of discord in our generation. The enemy would like you to think of God as a kill joy. He would like you to think that the only way that you can be happy is to be completely free 
completely on your own, with no responsibilities, with no one telling you what to do. Just make your own decisions all the time and you're going to be happy. But that's a lie. <laughs> that is deception of the highest order. And it's a deception that's been going on since Adam and Eve were deceived. Oh, God's really killing your joy, taking away. You're going to be like him if you just take that apple or um, fruit. It wasn't necessarily an apple pie. Jesus calls you to the joy of trusting him. Then we have commands. What happens if we do not trust Jesus? If you don't trust Jesus, you're never going to know the joy of trusting in him to lead you and to direct you and actually to save you. You're not really free to have that joy. That's not an option. It will all be up to you and you're not going to succeed. You'll think you're free, but you'll really be in a prison of your own making because your prison walls will be your own experience, your own reading, your own viewing, your own experiences, your own tiny time and place in history will be like a wall shutting you into prison. Your choices will be bound by your own sinful perspective and the Lord frees us from that when we come to him because he is timeless <laughs> and he's present with his people everywhere. We are transported to that kind of perspective, too, and that enables us to have joy. Trust in Jesus, and you're free to live joyfully right now. Right now. Jesus leads our way, and his command leads us to joy. Joy comes in trusting Jesus' words, and remember, they will never pass away. And so we can take heed, keep watch, stay on alert, stay awake, be on alert. What for? For Jesus. <laughs> and this is the way to have joy when the world seems to be falling apart around us or around America. When the pie is being cut and being served, it's not time to get on your coat and get out the door and go somewhere else. No, pay attention. The great host is calling us to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Better things than pie await us. The family meal, the marriage supper of the Lamb, is about to be served. And the joy of trusting Jesus will exceed whatever you can do on your own, your own plans or your perspective. You know what the latest addition to the National Park Service system is? New River Gorge. New River Gorge. Right here, West Virginia. That's right. Good. You probably know the name... Well, if you know the last one on the list, you probably know the first one on the list as well. What was the first national park? Yes. Yellowstone National Park, that's right. And what state does that happen to be in? Wyoming and? Montana. Montana, yes. Yellowstone National Park absolutely stunned the first English-speaking visitors that came there. And it continues to amaze people that come from all over the world and speak all kinds of languages when you're there. Yellowstone Park has this fascinating mixture of unpredictable things and predictable things going on. The landscape is predictable, but it's unpredictable at the same time. It's the only place that I've ever been in the world where it was snowing in the middle of June. And it was snowing when we went there last. Gigantic, oh, I can't get my pictures up. Gigantic underground furnaces of molten rock, magma, are right near the surface, and they form the scalding hot pools of water that are there. And then there are signs that warn you, stay on the path. But you know what happens. Predictably, every year, somebody gets wiser than the sign, or thinks they are, and gets burned by going where they should not go. And Old Faithful Geyser is there too, and with boiling water blasting out, it's about to go off here. Well, no, it already has, because it's all... No, it's, it's not wet there yet, <laughs> but it will be. Okay, so uh, Old Faithful 
regular, predictable time. But again, there are signs and guardrails keep people in the right place. Wildlife is also there at Yellowstone. All kinds of things roam around uh, freely and very unpredictably at uh, Yellowstone. Last time we were there, we saw a uh, grizzly bear mother and had two cubs, twin cubs, tiny little things. Oh, they look cute, but we stayed at a distance. <laughs> you don't mess with grizzly bear mothers or other mothers. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, let's see if we can find another picture of this. Bison, very close to the road, about ready to come out. Elk actually came down right in front of us, almost hit the elk. Moose are there, too. Uh, unpredictable. Now, signs warn you of danger of these wild animals, but again, predictably, every year, Someone ignores the warning signs and gets close, too close to the animals, and what happens? Well, either they get really hurt, or the animals, harm comes to the animals in some fashion. And there are signs there of dangerous footing, uh, and people ignore the signs, and they crawl out where they're not supposed to be, and the, it gives way, and they fall way down and into the hot springs or down into the waterfalls, into the canyons, other places like that. Side by side, we have beauty and danger. And they look identical at Yellowstone. And so it is. Also, with the second coming of Jesus Christ. Trust in Jesus. Trust in Jesus. And that brings joy. Because Jesus is reliable. And his words and he is the living Word of God, and He's completely reliable. And we anticipate His second coming with joy, even more than another trip to a national park. But we also have joy in trusting Jesus right now and following His guidance, His commands, right now as the time approaches. Believers live with joy in Jesus right now as we trust Jesus for an even greater joy to take place than the first Advent, for, uh, first Christmas. Everlasting life at the second coming of Christ forevermore. So at Yellowstone, you have the predictable and the unpredictable side by side in these marvelous landscapes. In the same way, Jesus gives you the joy of watching for his soon, but yet sudden, second coming. So we get to watch with joy. Bow in prayer. Dear Lord, we know that not everybody is watching with joy. There are these two reactions. No, I'm not going to believe the signs. I'm just going to do my own way. And Lord, our heart goes out to the people that are not paying attention, not ready, not prepared. And, and we grieve because they don't have that joy. And they're not anticipating the same way we are. And Lord, we, we long for many to have that joy. And we thank you for that joy. And we ask, Lord, even now, you might renew our joy in Jesus Christ. And give us excitement and energy, not just about Christmas, but about your second coming making everything right forevermore. Lord, bless your people today and forever with joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and we'll respond with angels we have heard on high.
receive the benediction. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Amen. God be with you and bless you.